In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's lonely being a Lutheran. One of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, a German by the name of Hermann Zasse, who was a contemporary of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, resisted the Nazis and fled to Australia. A collection of his essays is titled The Lonely Way. It's actually, you can find it in two volumes. It's published by our publishing house, Concordia. And that phrase, the lonely way, occurs in an essay from 1943. Zasa writes, As Luther once went the lonely way between Rome and spiritualism, so the Lutheran church today stands alone between the world powers of Roman Catholicism on the one hand and modern Protestantism on the other. Her doctrine, which teaches that the Spirit is bound to the means of grace, is as inconceivable to modern people in the 20th century as it was to their predecessors in the 16th. To be a Lutheran is to travel a lonely road, but it's the only road that I want to be on. What's at the heart of being Lutheran? Well, there are two essential aspects of Reformation teaching that I want to share with you this morning. The first was stated in that quote from Hermann Zasse. The Spirit is bound to the means of grace. Where is the Holy Spirit at work with grace? In what we call the means of grace. The Holy Spirit works when the Word of God is read and preached. The Holy Spirit is at work in the visible Word joined to water in holy baptism, joined to bread and wine in the Holy Communion. Now, the Holy Spirit, of course, is everywhere, but He isn't everywhere in a way that we can apprehend. And this is key. The Holy Spirit locates Himself, says, here I am, find me here. He binds himself to working in the Word and the sacraments, not only as the means by which God delivers to us His good gifts, but He locates Himself there for our certainty, for our assurance. And so when you hear the holy absolution, you can know, you can be certain that it's the very declaration of God that your sins are forgiven. When the water is poured over the head of one being baptized and you hear the Word of God spoken, you can know and be certain there God is working and acting. And when the Word of God comes to you and is attached to bread and wine, you can know, you can be certain that the bread and wine is what Jesus said, His body, His blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And you can believe His promises attached there Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. After the Reformation was underway, radicals arose to destroy external things in churches. And so they smashed statues, and they crushed crucifixes, they shattered stained glass, They even sang with only the Psalter, with only the the Psalms as they're recorded in the Bible, and they sang without harmony, just one melody line. They They got rid of things too ornamental, nothing too ornate in the church. And this eradication of external things also led to a hostility to the word and sacraments. Now, these radicals were called enthusiasts, which didn't mean that they were all excited about something. Enthusiasm means to look for God within instead of without. That's what enthusiasm means. The the thus part of enthusiasm is actually the Greek word theos, God. So it's entheos, it's God within, looking for God inside of yourselves. And so enthusiasts stopped looking for God in His Word and in the things that Jesus established, holy baptism, the holy communion. And they taught instead to look inside of yourself, to find God in your heart, 
Find him in your thoughts, in your feelings, in your emotions. And thus, the truest word of God becomes what your heart is telling you. But listen to the prophet Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Far from looking to the heart for guidance, Jesus taught that the human heart is the source of evil. Jesus said, those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Our hearts are desperately wicked. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. Our heart needs reformation. Instead of the means of grace, some teach that the Holy Spirit, in addition to being located in the heart or to be sought after in the heart, that the Holy Spirit is located in the church. Now, to be sure, the Holy Spirit works through the church, which is why as soon as we confess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we immediately go on to say, the Holy Christian Church. But the error is when popes and councils and synods and churches declare traditions and doctrines of men as the Word of God and the moving of the Holy Spirit. And this is why, as appealing as Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy may be, and there is an appeal there, we are the true church founded by the apostles. Even in its appeal, we can't be part of their communions because they locate the Holy Spirit as working surely and infallibly through the leaders of the church. And we can't say amen to that. And so we must walk the lonely way. We must walk the lonely way between these various churches, not out of a sense of pride, not out of a sense of arrogance or separatism, but because there we can't find certainty, the certainty of God's Word. Only in the Holy Scriptures can we find the sure and certain grace of the Holy Spirit, the sure and certain Word of God. And then that word working through the sacraments that Jesus instituted. When I go to confession, my heart judges me. You're a sinner. You're a hypocrite. You dare to stand before those people and tell them what to do, teach them how to be and what to believe. You fail at every single point. Who do you think you are? You don't measure up. God's going to reject you. Yet what I feel about it doesn't matter. What God says to me matters, and I know what He says to me from His Word. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that leads to the second emphasis at the heart of the Reformation, a rediscovery or even a recovery, perhaps, of the Bible's teaching about justification you can see it in the very last verse of today's epistle. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. To be justified is to be declared righteous. And we may think of it in terms of a court of law where the accused is rendered guilty or not guilty. Justification, in the first sense, is being declared not guilty. Your sins aren't counted against you. You can think of examples from everyday life when we try to justify our, justify our own actions. We're trying to get ourselves acquitted from the appearance of wrongdoing. And so if I show up late to a meeting, I may seek to justify my tardiness by talking about the traffic or the construction or, well, something came up at home when a student is misbehaving at school or unprepared for a test. Rarely does that student confess and admit to the truth, I was 
unprepared. Or, oh, it's, it was my fault. Instead, you hear justifications heaped upon justifications. He did it to me first. Well, I didn't have time to study because... And as we grow older, these justifications just become more complex. And we deceive ourselves with them. But we can't justify ourselves, no matter how hard we try. We can't declare ourselves to be in the right not before God. God's word is clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. You do not measure up. You have made other things and other people your gods ahead of the one true God. You have misused God's name. Your worship and your prayers have faltered. You haven't listened to God's word. You have dishonored your parents and other authorities. You have harmed your neighbor. You have not led a sexually pure and decent life. You have spun what happened in order to come off looking good. And you've been dissatisfied with what God's given you. With your wife, your husband, your children, your job. You name it. You have all fallen short of the glory of God and deserve nothing but God's wrath and displeasure. And I am right there alongside you. That's the truth of God's Word. That's the law. That's the accusing hammer blow of the law. But there's another truth. Another truth which is at the heart and center of the Holy Scriptures. And it is, it is at the heart of the very center of Lutheran doctrine, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And that means that justification, being declared righteous, just, holy, comes from outside of you. What comes from within you is desperately wicked, but outside of you, what you have not and could not be or do, stands Jesus the God-man, His active obedience, performing the law, all the requirements of the law perfectly on your behalf. His passive obedience, receiving the punishment that you deserve. All of it. His active and His passive obedience to His Father's will is counted, it's given, it's credited to you for your justification. And so you, a sinner with this desperately wicked heart, are declared holy, pure, sinless. You, hopeless, are granted hope. You, dying, are given life. Not by what you do, but in what Christ Jesus does. And that truth, so widely rejected throughout Christendom today, is what makes it lonely being a Lutheran. And whether we're Lutherans from the cradle or adult converts, whether we've been here for years or we've just arrived, we must continually ask ourselves, what does it mean to be Lutheran? <laughs> Lutheranism is not allegiance to Luther. Get that straight right away. Lutheranism is not allegiance to Luther. Lutheranism is not an allegiance to an ethnic background. It matters not that you're German or Norwegian or Sweden, Swedish or whatever culture you may descend from. The center of world, world Lutheranism is going to be Africa anyway, not too long from now if it already isn't. What does it mean to be Lutheran? The man that I referred to at the beginning, Hermann Zasse, he wrote a book that we've translated into English. It's called Here We Stand, but the, the German title, if you'll permit me a little German, is Was heißt Lutherisch? What does, it mean, what does Lutheran mean? What does it mean to be Lutheran? When I have the opportunity to answer that question for people, for people who are really, they really want to know, well, what, is, what does it mean to be Lutheran? They typically start with the small catechism. Read the small catechism first. 
And if there's interest beyond that, it's the Augsburg Confession. If you want to know what, the, what being a Lutheran is, go to the Augsburg Confession. If you've got a book of Concord at home, it's in there. The Augsburg Confession. This is what our churches believe, teach, and confess. It's as true for us today as it was for those who confessed it June 25th, 1530. And then if we go beyond that, I say read this book by Hermann Zasse. Here we stand. Was heißt Lutherisch? What does it mean to be called Lutheran? <laughs> Reformation isn't a 16th century event. Reformation is an event that must happen every Lord's Day when we gather here. Every new morning that God gives to us. Semper reformanda, ecclesia est, the church is always reforming. And each of us must always be reforming too. Just as the 16th century Reformation happened by a return to the Bible's teaching of repentance and justification, so we must constantly be repenting, constantly returning to justification, the declaration of the sinner to be just before a just God, righteous before a righteous God, holy before a holy God. As Luther puts it in his small catechism, when dealing with holy baptism, daily dying. We daily walk in repentance and contrition and faith. Every single day is living the life of a baptized child of God. That's living the justified life. Justification happened on the cross, but justification is never merely a past event. It's always present reality. You are justified. I am justified. You are baptized. I am baptized. Holy baptism delivers to us justification. And the entire Christian life is the living out of that justification. The name Luther? Well, in the grand scheme of things, it's not all that important. The Bible that gave, that Luther gave to people in their own language, that's important. The biblical teaching of justification, the free forgiveness of sins, God's declaring you righteous in His sight, that's what's important. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That truth alone brings reformation to the church. That truth alone brings peace to our troubled souls. In Jesus' name.